Uh, up next will be uh, uh, Dr. Don Falk with the University of Arizona talking about ecosystem resilience and changing fire regime. So, um, uh, thanks to Dan for setting the stage in terms of the climate drivers. I'm going to switch over now to asking what the ecological consequences are of possible changes to fire regimes. And I think Tim is going to return to the question of how those regimes are, uh, are changing. So, so the, I mean, you can start, I know what I'm saying. So, the first distinction I want to make that's important to make in terms of ecological consequences would be between the effects of climate acting alone and the effects of climate climate acting in concert with disturbance. A very important distinction, and I'll show some data later to explain why we need to make that distinction very carefully. The effects of climate acting alone are exemplified by increasing levels, increasing rates of tree mortality, which we're seeing throughout the West, more than 100 million dead trees in the southern Sierra Nevada, <coughs> episodic, increasingly episodic uh, tree mortality, throughout the West in the absence of fire. And uh, obviously, tree mortality typically involves other agents, specific insects. So I'm not addressing, I'm not saying that these are disturbance-free settings, but these are settings in which fire is not playing that key role. A variety of studies have documented the increasing rates of tree mortality in the absence of fire throughout the, the West. But the fact is, that fire, when it occurs, can trigger very dramatic, very rapid, and potentially irreversible change in a sense that climate acting alone does not. This includes the soil effects, changes to forest structure, many other effects of a, of a severe um, fire. And so the, the, we're led very quickly to the conclusion that it's an interaction of fire with climate change that's gonna have the most dramatic uh, consequences. And as I'll try to show you, this includes not only the immediate first order effects of a fire that is the period in which the fire is live, but also the ecological consequences and the reassembly of ecosystems afterwards, which are all also very much influenced by this disturbance climate interaction. So the first thing to get our heads around is the amount of area that wildfire is affecting, especially uh, in Western North America. And just in this brief presentation, I've just compiled a few slides to illustrate this point. Can you drop the pointer? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are the Jemez Mountains in uh, uh, northern New Mexico, where um, the, the colors in each polygon reflect <coughs> in a particular decade going back to the 1970s. And you can kind of infer from the domain of the slide that um, about 40% of the entire Hamas Mountains has experienced wildfire um, in just a few decades. The central panel is from a similar study in the central, in the central Sierra Nevada. And on the right side, uh, uh, fire perimeter is compiled from the monitoring trends for burn severity um, uh, for the western U.S., with the brown areas being the areas that are fall within a fire perimeter. Now, bearing in mind that a fire perimeter does not mean that everything inside that perimeter burns severely, um, it nonetheless suggests that the area, the total aggregate cumulative area being exposed to wildfire may be larger than we think when we look back just a few decades. And the shocking case to me is always to look at Alaska. These are cumulative fire perimeters going back to the 1950s. As you can see in central Alaska, you don't have to go very far before you are in a forest that is in some degree in a post-fire recovery. And so the take home here is that wildfire is no longer a kind of special case. It's often a corner or a certain part of the landscape. It actually is increasing, is affecting an increasingly high proportion of landscapes. And if we go back just a few decades, the cumulative area is quite consequential. We've recently done some work on what this might look like going into the future. And just to build on what, what Dan said about um, uh, changes in potential uh, future climate and how they might drive fire regimes. The upper panel shows our projections of changes in area burned um, between now and mid-century based on a fairly mid-level uh, emission scenario. The darker red colors indicate a higher percent increase in area burn. And again, this says nothing about fire severity, 
for the hydrologic consequences, all the other things that often go on fire. This is simply a question of area burn. We did this by calibrating uh, Leroy Westerling's area burn database for a 35-year period against seasonal climate, um, and then projecting that onto uh, this mid-range emissions. And interestingly, when we broke this down by season, I think this may be something that Tim comes back to, we found that the first five principal components, which were primarily winter and spring conditions with a, a bit of summer, that explained about 87% of the year-to-year -year variation in area burn. The model was quite powerful. And as you can see by the way we did this, this was done in 1,500 grid cells in the western U.S., so we built a, a model specifically for each grid cell in the belief that climate drives wildfire differently depending where you are and geographically in relation to atmospheric circulation, topography, and forest type. So the take home here is that the seasonal climate changes, which Dan showed, um, are have, playing a very powerful influence in expanding this multiplier and accelerator role of wildfire. So the question then becomes, it's a kind of conditional probability statement. Given that wildfire has occurred, what is the ecological consequence? How will ecosystems recover? And I use recover perhaps not even the right word, maybe the better word would be change. How will systems change from exposure to wildfire in a period of climate change? That is the fundamental question. So in order to address this in a, this brief setting, we can fall back to the language of resilience, um, a much discussed and much understood term. Uh, for today's purposes, we simply want to break the ecological response into these three phases of resistance, recovery, and reorganization. When you put these together, these collectively provide the mechanisms of ecosystem resilience. And so we illustrate how this may be playing out. So on the resistance side, the resistance is the um, most easily expressed in the life history evolution of fire adapted species, such as um, uh, pines um, in the, in the um, uh, diploxylon family of pines, the thick bark and elevated canopies. A fire comes through, there's really very little physiological effect on the tree. They can resist that stressor. And so whatever effects there are, maybe uh, a few seedlings kill, maybe a, a scar formed, but essentially the, the displacement of that population or that community from its starting point pr prior to the fire is gonna be very small. So these are systems that can resist or tolerate that level of disturbance. A second level would then be a case where, where some mortality has happened. So you're now, you've overcome the resistance of individuals and you're now dealing with a population level uh, recovery. And so an example of this would be wildfires that do create pockets of mortality where the pre-fire trees are actually killed. And they go through a period where they're going to have to reestablish. And of course, in the West, often the signature of that process would be other early successional species such as aspen that fill that gap for a period of time until the pre-fire community reestablishes. So this is what we would refer to as a recovery process. There was mortality, resistance was overcome, but eventually, through a, a fairly regulated successional process, the system goes back to its pre-fire state. So these two examples are what most of us would consider a resilient ecosystem. And even though this loop here, the aspen loop, might take a century, most people would look at a system that was conifer and now has dominated by aspen or other early successional species, and we would say, fine. That's a recovering system. We know where it's going. This is a familiar trajectory, and, and um, this falls within what we would call resilience. The problem is that that's not what we're seeing anymore. We're increasingly seeing very divergent post-fire successional pathways. Uh, it's suggesting that systems are not simply cycling back to where they are, but that they're going into a new state. So here's four photographs from post-fire plots in the Chiricahua Mountains, these are plots that were exposed both to the 1994 Rattlesnake Fire and the 2011 Horseshoe 2 Fire. Um, and the surprising thing about these four photographs is that in 1993, they were all the same forest type. And as you can see, partly due to the combination of different fire severities, low, medium, high, indicated by the 
letters on the slide, uh, but also factors that we did not take into account, such as seed dispersal and other processes. You're getting very, very different outcomes here. Now, this may be a short-term process. We don't know. This is post-2011, so we could be seeing just the short, just the beginning of the successional process. But we have plots that are grass-dominated, shrub-dominated, aspen-dominated, and other plots I'm not showing here that have immediately recovered into the pre-forest vegetation type. So this suggests a very different kind of setting where instead we're crossing some kind of tipping point and we're going into a new space and the system is going to be resilient in that new configuration. A classic example of this is cheatgrass dominated systems in the Great Basin, which cross over a tipping point, um, and once they are cheatgrass dominated, you've now left the sh uh, shrub step and you are now in a grass fire cycle, and the system is very resilient in that new configuration. The system, none of us really like cheatgrass domination in the Great Basin, so we don't want to call it resilient, but in fact it meets every definition of resilience. And moreover, then we have the case that we're seeing in many situations where these post-fire successional trajectories are very unpredictable. They're very divergent. So I would say increasingly the ecological evidence is that systems that are being exposed to high severity fire during a period that is stressful for recruitment, for seedling survival and growth, um, and possibly resorting the uh, competitive interactions between species, that this interaction between climate stress and disturbance is the combination that's most likely to provoke very rapid and very significant uh, ecosystem change. In particular, we're seeing trends toward loss of forest and replacement of shrub and grassland systems. And again, we're not enough decades into this to know if this is a permanent type conversion or if this is a new transitional state. We can't tell that. But what we do see is that these new systems are very resilient in their new state, often because they bring a new fire regime with them, which would tend to preclude the persistence of the pre-fire dominance. And now, so the, the bottom line here then would be, as we go out and look at landscapes throughout the West, if you're tuned into this, you see them everywhere. This is a, a gamble oak dominated uh, um, uh, hill slope in the Pecos Mountains in New Mexico, and you can see by the dead skeletons of trees, this was a forest, this was dry mixed conifer forest. It's now been taken over by a perfectly good early successional card carrying native species, Quercus gambelii. Um, but that is a type conversion, and gamble oak will bring a different fire regime, it will tend to preclude the conversion back to forest. So when we look at the mountains around us, and when I would say when you look at the mountains around you, Ask yourself, how many years has it been since that landscape has seen fire? It's probably been within the last few decades. And what stage of recovery it is, and get out of our thinking of these systems as in any way equilibrium, because that equilibrium condition seems more and more like a special case. Okay, so lastly then, where do we, where do, we do with this, these kinds of observations? Well, it's very difficult for us to discriminate what kinds of change are actually adaptive and what kinds of change are destructive of biological diversity. That gamble oak hill slope conversion is probably very tough and drought resistant. It's going to prevent soil erosion. It's good wildlife habitat. You can make a case for it. Um, how do we interpret this into management actions on the ground? Very, very challenging. But I would say that in my conversations with, state, with land managers, they increasingly recognize that this is the fact on the ground and that we can't wish these changes away again because of this interaction of disturbance and changing climate. And that leads us to the third most uncomfortable question, which is, are we going to have to let go of some ecosystems that even within our lifetime were widespread and dominant, and at least in certain places, except that those are not either adaptable or even possible moving into the future? Thank you. <laughs>